I'm Mona Sabani. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I recently opened up to spirituality and launched kind of a personal investigation into some of the things that science can't explain. So I was never interested in spirituality or religion. I was very hardcore scientific materialist and a traditionally trained scientist, and the worlds don't usually collide. But there was a period in my life where I encountered a series of events And my culture is I'm Persian. That's my cultural heritage. And in our culture, we have traditions that are more mystical that Western science cannot explain, doesn't bother to, like divination. Uh, And so my grandmother had used these practices and my mother did too. And one in particular, they would use coffee grinds, not American coffee. It's like a different, thicker kind of coffee. They would leave it in the cup. It would form pictures and they would use it for intuiting things about someone's past, present, or future. And my mom did this. And so that time in my life when I had these like series of events happen, they were all upsetting. My mom foresaw some of them and like with eerie accuracy and details And that was kind of my opening because my world got turned upside down. I couldn't understand how she could know these things, where this information was coming from. It didn't vibe with the model of the universe that I was taught in my training. So none of it made sense. And I lived in cognitive dissonance for a long time, kind of ignoring it until it got to a point where enough things happened that I was just tipped over into being curious for the first time. Whereas before I resisted curiosity because I knew it would append my worldview, which would be chaotic, which is what happened. I didn't think any research had been done on divination or psychic phenomena. So I started with personal experience. So it started with my mom. And then I started interviewing and exploring, getting readings from people who are intuitive or mystics. And then the experience just compounded to the point where I'm like, okay, well, experientially, this is weird and real, and I can't explain it. And then at some point, I, while I was interviewing them, I was interviewing my scientist colleagues too, to kind of be like, am I nuts? But then eventually people started recommending to me books and papers. And they're like, this has actually been studied, not only psychic phenomena, but, you know, like maybe consciousness survives death. There's all this literature on near-death experiences, on reincarnation. And so I started digging into the literature and then that that just launched. I mean, there was so much to read that took me into a rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole of mind-blowing literature and research and information. It's not all the research was fascinating and compelling. And then I think if that hadn't been the case, I would have not continued down that road. But because it was speaking my language, which was science, it kept me engaged. So there was all this research on psychic phenomena that had spanned over a hundred years and spanned like, I don't know how many continents, but a lot of them, like maybe six continents, multiple different countries, different labs. And it was really good research. Like when I read it, I was familiar with the protocols and the statistics and it it was all very compelling. And then when I had the near-death experiences, I thought that was interesting because of course, as a neuroscientist, when you're reading some of those more scientific cases, there's no brain activity, but then there's all this reported phenomenological experience from the person, and which is kind of a gray area because you don't know what's happening and when their consciousness starts or ends or what's going on. But what I thought was interesting about those cases when they would report something that they saw or heard in some other space time, like either out in the hall or the waiting room or somewhere else. And then those things turned out to be true. I thought that was interesting. And then I thought the reincarnation research from the University of Virginia was really, really weird and very compelling. So really most of it was pretty compelling. So, I mean, I'm not doing any like research in this area currently, but what I am doing is, so my focus is really on the journey of what I call, or actually Jeff Kripal, who's the chair of philosophy and religious studies at Rice University. He calls this worldview thing, 
the flip, like people who go from one world, you have an experience and suddenly you're like, whoa, what I understood to be reality and my way of understanding reality doesn't make sense. And then they flip into either exploring or fully adopting another worldview. And that flip is really, really difficult, as I sort of alluded to earlier, because your whole identity and all your values and beliefs and your emotions are tied into your worldview. So the reason now that I've been in the science and spirituality space for a while, spiritual people constantly say, why can't scientists be more open-minded? Like, why don't they look at the evidence? And it's rational, it's emotional, because they it might be subconscious, but they know that you know, encountering this kind of thing would cause them upheaval in their lives, in their work, in everything. And so the flip is difficult. And sometimes it happens to people like me who didn't want it. And then it's mentally really difficult. It's kind of like anguish. It's just like mental anguish because you can't reconcile it. And then parts of yourself start dying and you don't know who you are anymore. And so I've been really focused on this area of how to make scientists feel more comfortable sharing these experiences. Like if we talk about it more, it's not as weird and taboo. And then once that starts happening though, and some more of them start flipping, they're going to need support. And so one of my collaborators and I do this, we create spaces at the neuroscience conference where they can come share their stories. We can all talk about what if we're wrong, (laughs) like what if our model of the universe is wrong? What other models are there? And then the research part is kind of like, what do they need to to feel supported and feel safe enough to to flip or to come into this new worldview? Like, what does it take to make it as easy as possible for them? And they need a community of similar people, I think, because one thing that I encountered is it's like hard to find that we're like unicorns, like scientists who have flipped. So there are communities but a lot of us don't know about those communities. And so it's very lonely. And if you feel alone, that threatens your core stability and makes it harder for you to let go some of the old beliefs or some of the things that are holding you back from opening your mind. So one of the most important things is a community, obviously for scientific evidence is really important. That's why it's super important for all this research to actually be done in all of these fields that we mentioned, because without the studies, they can't even seriously, like it will stay out of the science realm and it will stay in their personal lives. But if you bring the research, then they can start to engage with it. So you really need the actual science, you need a community. And then we also need, as I mentioned, the stories, like just sharing stories, but also personal experience. So helping them feel safe to have more personal experiences. And I'm sure you know, the more you have, the more you have, (laughs) the more open you are, the more they come. And it's just opening it to it without the fear holding you back, because then you can more accurately engage with it and not keep it at arm's length. Like it's not just scientific findings and it's like they're science, but I've also experienced it. So I have like multiple types of data and evidence and yeah, so they need, they need multiple things, but definitely a community of like-minded and just similar characteristics, like people with similar characteristics. That's really important because, and I often joke about it, like you can't have scientists come in and then into a room with spiritual people who've always been spiritual and they're like saging them. Like that just won't work for them. Like That's not going to make them feel safe. So it has to be people who are, who've had similar journeys to them. This is more and more true for our whole society, right? Because Western society emphasizes rational thought and scientism, which is different from science, which is scientism is more like a, it's like the religion of science. It's like, even though science is just a tool, we've turned it into kind of a religion or a cult. So more and more people besides just scientists need all of that. Everything that I just mentioned, that's a good question. Where can they go? Well, I'm building a community. Well, I'm building it for scientists, but anyone's welcome. And we've had lawyers who flip, you know, doctors, people in a lot of different kinds, Wall Street, bankers, all different kinds of fields, people who were considered themselves atheist or agnostic, complete rationalists, and suddenly find themselves in this very uncertain space. Yeah, I have a community. I have a substack that is called 
Cosmos Coffee and Consciousness, and we're building out that community. And I'm in the process of putting together a lot of this evidence that we talked about, like an easy to read formats, kind of like to have the data at your fingertips, because that's another problem is nobody has time to read or the training to read (laughs) all the scientific studies or even books. So kind of distilling down the findings into you know, really easy to read, like short summary so that they can have it, whether it's for themselves or to share with other people. The problem with a lot of this phenomena or why people have issues with it is because it doesn't fit into the mainstream model of the mind and the brain, which in modern day science, it's thought that the mind emerges from the brain or consciousness emerges from the actual physical brain. And that when someone dies and the brain stops working, then the mind and the consciousness are gone too. But a lot of these experiences that people have are what we call non-local and basically means they're not tied down to one space time. And like you could receive information from the past or the future, like my mom did. So it's non-local, which It doesn't make sense in Newtonian physics, but does make sense with quantum physics. But even though we have quantum physics, we haven't incorporated that fully into more normal mainstream hardcore science like neuroscience. So neuroscience focuses mostly on Newtonian physics. And so therefore, it's impossible that you could have information from another location or from another time. And, you know, the belief is that once your brain dies, your consciousness dies too. But a lot of these experiences put that into question. And so the hardest part for me was when I reached that, when they started suggesting things. And I remember the moment when I first read, like maybe consciousness isn't tied to the brain. And I just kind of rolled my eyes like, okay, these people are (laughs) crazy. But the more that I read. And the reason for that is because in science, they don't train you in philosophy. They train us in physics, but Newtonian physics. So they don't train you in any of these other fields. So you don't know that there's any other possible worldview. And you also don't know that the issue of like the worldview or philosophy, which one is correct, is not settled. <laughs> like Nobody has decided physicalism is it, that the universe is definitely only made of physical matter. Science has just decided that and moves forward on that assumption, but in actuality, that debate is not settled. So because we don't know that when we encounter this kind of information, it's just a wall to us of like, we can't go past what we know. This is what we were trained in. We don't know that there's a possibility outside of it. So you just kind of hit a wall. And then it's not until you hit philosophy and quantum physics where you're like, oh, it's wow, it actually is possible. Like there's these other worldviews where these experiences are better accommodated than the one we use now. Before this journey, I actually did not like thinking about consciousness because the field of neuroscience, like you said, doesn't really define it that well. Or the main way that they study it is when you're awake versus like when you're under anesthesia or when you're asleep. So, but there's a lot of other in-between altered states of consciousness that we don't study. But now that I've done a lot of the personal experiences, I mean, it's hard to put into words. I think of it as just awareness. And I think that it can be difficult if you have not had an altered state of consciousness, like a really powerful one, like on a psychedelic or on breath work or a deep one during meditation. I think the word awareness doesn't quite work for those people. Like it didn't work for me before I had these because I would just be like, what does that mean? Or yeah, okay, guess awareness. But it's only when you start to experiment for yourself because consciousness is just subjective. That's all you have. We can't even compare each other's subjective experiences. I can't show you mine. You can't show me yours. So it's totally subjective. It could even be different for each person. We don't actually know. So I think when you start to personally experiment, you start to see the nuances in the states of consciousness and and then it's hard to put into words what it is. But it's like, if you ask me what it is, I mean, I have an experience of what it is, but I don't know how to put it into words. But the easiest, I mean, I always just say awareness and in neuroscience too, the shortcut is you say, you know, it's like, what is it like to be me? What is it like to be you? That's your 
conscious experience and my conscious experience. I think sometimes people can be like, oh, why would I waste time thinking about this? Or if the mainstream model is the mainstream one. But what I found is that there's a lot you're missing. So it's kind of like if you're in a mansion and then you only stay in one room, you know, why would you do that? <laughs> like, why wouldn't you go out and explore the gardens and see all the other rooms, the living room, the kitchen, whatever. And I think it has real implications for how we view death. And I think death is a very avoided topic in Western culture. It's scary. We think it's just the end and people are frightened of it. But if you understand, like if we can show that consciousness doesn't end with death, in fact, it might be nicer than life, depending on your point of view. I mean, that changes a lot of things for our culture and our society. And I think that's one of the more important implications because there's just so much fear and anxiety around death for everyone. So yeah, that's that's important. Also, for the people they leave behind though, so I, hopefully I won't cry, but I just lost somebody. And I think sometimes a lot of the sorrow, like if I step back into a Western worldview, the sorrow there is that this person is gone and it's just a void. And that brings like a lot of pain and heartbreak <laughs> at that thought. And also like you feel sadness for them, like what did they encounter or whatnot? So for me, it's been very comforting to have all this other information to be like, well, may, you know, like not necessarily is this person gone? Maybe the form that I knew, but it's possible they're continuing on. And also, you know, if you read your death experience accounts and stuff, like hopefully it was nice. <laughs> hopefully it sounds like, or was one of the nicer experiences for them. So it's more like, yeah, I think for the people who are left behind who lose someone, I think that like loss and sense of finality that can be alleviated.